for our teaching time to continue in our series about how to have a courageous faith and a courageous life, we begin with a word of scripture. And I want you to listen in Jesus's words for his clarity, for his conviction, and for his candor. Listen to these words from John 14. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. Other translations say rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas, you remember in the other parts of the gospel, Thomas the doubter is his nickname. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip then said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then, you, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will will do it. To me, this is some of the most clear and convicting words that Jesus offers to his disciples and to his future followers, those of us some 2,000 years later after he originally said these words. And in these words, it summarizes where we've been the last couple of weeks in this series called Courage. In the first week, we talked about how we wanted to have clarity that when God calls us to do something or gives us a new direction or pushes us uh, and maybe outside of our comfort zone, we can see with clarity what God is calling us to do and we can have courage along the way. And then last week we talked about how the next step is to have some conviction, that when God does place that new idea or that new ministry or that new vision for our life or perhaps that new challenge in our life, we can move forward with conviction, knowing that it is God who has called us to do this work. And the good news is that if God calls us, God will walk alongside of us each step of the way. And that is a gift, to know that God walks with us in all things. And so that's where we've been in the first two weeks. And today we shift and we think about the next part of the word courage. And we're going to be focusing today on the word candor. Yeah, I didn't think that would get a round of applause, but we are focusing on the word candor. Now, that word might feel a little dated to you, or you might not even be familiar with the word. This week, Jessica asked me in the kitchen, she said, honey, what are you preaching on this week? And I said, how we have to have courage and we have to have candor. And my wife is a very smart person. And she looked at me in the eyes and she said, I don't think I've ever heard the word candor in my life. And I said, this sermon is either going to be an A or an F. I don't know. Uh, but you all get to be the judge. So before you turn off your ears and you start thinking about what you got to do this afternoon, let me tell you what candor is, why it's important, and then you can decide if it's worth listening to the rest of the way. So candor is the ability to be open, honest, direct, and frank in speech and conversation. And here's the truth. When we speak with candor, that usually means we're speaking with a little bit of risk as well. And we're taking a risk in these types of conversations. And we have to set aside our own fear 
when we have those conversations and we have to focus on not hurting others with our words, but how might we help them? Uh, Another side of this is that uh, candor is undergirded with honesty. It doesn't veer into contempt or being rude, but it also doesn't veer just into small talk and common pleasantries and beating around the bush of whatever we need to speak about. Candor is earnest. It desires to state facts plainly, observe actions openly, and to confront gently. And I said it once, I'll say it again. Perhaps the hardest truth, the hardest reality about candor is that fear gets in the way of these conversations happening all the time. Fear is that little voice that says in the back of our heads, if we have this conversation that requires me to be vulnerable, that might hurt someone's feelings or might make someone uncomfortable, I just don't want to do it. I'd rather just be a peacemaker and just try to move on and get along to go along. And Jesus never does that. Jesus never just says, oh, well, that's fine. You keep doing you and I'll do me. No, Jesus spoke with candor, even if he knew something bad might happen or he might have a little strain in his relationship. So candor, it's the capacity to take risks in conversations. Sometimes that conversation is with an individual, and other times it might be with an organization or an institution for accountability and growth and being a healthier person or organization. To do that, you have to have a frank and honest and sometimes difficult conversation to know where you're really at and if you're going in the right direction. Another way to think about candor might be to use the phrase candid. Uh, Maybe you're familiar from like America's Funniest Home Videos. You know, somebody's like, am I on candid camera? Uh, And it's a notion that, and if AFV reference just goes over your head, maybe a YouTube clip or something uh, like that. But it's when somebody uh, is embarrassed or has a prank played on them and they get their candid reaction. They get their honest and faithful response to whatever's happening in that moment. So that's what candor is, or to think about it as a candid moment. Now, you also probably noticed, especially if you worship here at Trinity regularly, today I open the sermon by reading a passage of Scripture. 95% of the time, I don't do that. I like to tell a story and get into it, but today we needed to start with some candor that Jesus said so we have a starting point. Because as I said, that's probably one of the most clear Scriptures that Jesus talks about this life and the next life in. That's also a meaningful scripture because that's one I almost always read at every funeral that I preside over. It's not often a text we talk about in church, but at almost every funeral that it is. And something that I've learned in ministry is that people don't oftentimes, most of the time, don't like to talk about death. It's uncomfortable. It requires a courageous conversation with those that you love. And I've learned the majority of families don't talk about what their final wishes are for their life. They don't share what they want their funeral to look like. They don't share what their legacy wants to be like. They don't talk about what they want to have happen to them in an emergency situation or one of those freak accident type moments if they end up in the hospital or when they might be moved into hospice. It's shocking to look at the numbers of how many Americans don't have an advanced medical directive or how many don't have a will. And it's because they require courageous and awkward and difficult conversations. And at the root of that is fear which is so unique to me that we have such fear surrounding death, especially as followers of Jesus, where every fiber of our being believes that we're going to have life and have it eternally. So why would we not want to end this part of our race well? And so many times when I sit with families after the passing of the loved one, I just hear, well, we didn't want to go there because it was uncomfortable. Or it was just too awkward. We were afraid to talk about it. 
And I want to say these is just, is just one of many examples of those big conversations we're required to have in this life because Jesus spoke candidly about this life. Jesus spoke candidly about death to the point where he foretold what his death would be, and then he told us with candor that he was coming back, and if we believe in him, we too will have life for eternity. I say all that to say this. I think candor might be one of the most important skills we need as people of faith. Let me talk about it this way. I'll ask you in the form of a question rather than me just telling you some more about candor. Think about this. What are some of the most important conversations you've been a part of in your life? Take a moment. Begin thinking back through the years. What are some of the most important conversations that you've had in your life? Or maybe one just popped into your mind. That one conversation that changed the trajectory of your life forever. Whose face just entered into your mind? I'm sure you remember what the conversation was about. Maybe you even remember what you were wearing or where you were when that conversation was happening. Maybe for you, it was a conversation that someone had with you at a young age when you were told that you needed to step up and help run the family because something had happened. Maybe it was a conversation about deciding where you wanted to go to college or what your first job was going to be. Or maybe the one that popped into your mind was you're thinking about that first crush you ever had and how you were going to work up the courage to ask them out on a date. Maybe it was deciding when you were ready to bring a child into the world for the first time, or you had to have a conversation with your boss about your job. Maybe it was one you needed to have with an aging parent, or a difficult conversation with a spouse because your marriage just wasn't working anymore. Maybe it was one where you had to set boundaries with a family member who was suffering with addiction. Or maybe your conversation was one you needed to have with Jesus because this life that you thought you were going to have, none of it is happening like you thought it would. You see, there are so many important conversations we have to have in this life, even if we don't want to. Usually the ones we don't want to have are the ones we need to have the most. Some of them, yes, are professional. Most are personal. Some are all of them are emotional. But I would suggest to you that every single one of those conversations is also spiritual. And all of them involve God and the power of the Holy Spirit in one way or another. But friends, if we don't have courage, if we don't have candor or the ability to speak with honesty, if we can't be courageous in our speech, then our words are simply empty. They're hollow. They're just words. But rather, Jesus calls us to have these conversations, and he gives us plenty of examples of how to do it in the Gospels. John 14 is just one of them. You could read the Gospels at every single page. You'll see Jesus speaking with candor, but here's the other side of it that I haven't said yet. Jesus always spoke the truth in love. Jesus always spoke the truth in love. He always had compassion on those who he was speaking to, even if they were kind of making him mad. Even if they annoyed him, Jesus had compassion and spoke the truth in love. And that doesn't mean in this type of conversation that we're to shout at one another or shout over someone else. We're not supposed to be bombastic or arrogant or I'm right and you're wrong and you need to sit there and listen to me. Jesus doesn't command us to behave that way. And just a little side note, if the Bible was written this year, Jesus would also probably add, don't call people names on social media. It's not a good look. Our words are a powerful thing. Our speech has the ability to lift people up with a simple phrase, but our words also have the power to tear someone down in an instant. Our words, our language, our tone, the way we speak to one another and treat one another, it matters a great deal. A great deal. So this morning we've established that Jesus used candor in his teaching and his preaching and his speaking with those that he loved, like his disciples in the passage, 
But also we've talked about the countless other examples that we can see in the Gospels where Jesus speaks the truth and love and with compassion of those who need a little bit of a reality check and a little bit of a wake-up call. Now I want to take a step back again and I want to show you a video clip from Bishop Berlin, the author of this series, as he talks about what this means to him and for all of us as well. Take a look at this. This is the U.S. Capitol building at the end of the National Mall in Washington. A lot of conversation happens inside that building. Elected representatives debate policies. They debate programs of the government. This building, in many ways, represents the importance of having courage in speech. Here, ideas are debated. People attempt to persuade one another and the nation about the worthiness of their ideas. Sometimes those discussions are very productive, and sometimes they turn ugly. Many people associate speaking with candor as being blunt, direct, even unrestrained in one's speech. But the best of candor is not about being bombastic or overbearing. It's more like what the scripture says when it says, speaking the truth in love. The best of candor is having the courage to be open and honest and speak from one's principles and convictions. And that can be done without damaging other people. It can be done without insulting or exaggerating or speaking untruths. The most productive work done by members of Congress happens when they're willing to have the courage to work together to solve difficult problems for the country. You know, the National Mall as a whole is a sacred ground of candor in the United States. Here, massive groups of people gather to express their views on just about every difficult social or political topic you can imagine. It literally stops the traffic. Huge crowds gather as people assemble to rally and hopefully influence public opinion. There is another form of courage that's here. And it's the willingness to take a stand on an important issue and to add your voice in the public square. Make no mistake, that is a really important part of candor, the willingness to stand up and speak on behalf of others. One day, my wife and I were in a museum on the mall. And outside, there was a big rally. We went out, and there were students from Parkland, Florida, who were leading that rally related to gun violence. All of those students had attended the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where 17 of their friends had died in a tragic school shooting. We went out and listened. We stood amongst the crowd. We took in several of those speeches. And it was moving. It was moving to hear the courage of these young men and women as they talked about the death of their classmates, the hopes that it would never happen again. They were bright and they were articulate. But what impressed me most was their willingness to share their story, to speak out for what they believed in. It takes courage to walk up a flight of stairs, step behind a podium, grasp a microphone, and take a stand. Think about your life for a moment. Consider the inner circle of your closest relationships. These are the people that are your family members, your close friends, people that are friends like family. It might also include your coworkers, the people you interact with every day. Now that's the inner circle. Let me ask you this. Are there conversations that you should be having with those people right now, but you've been afraid to have them? You didn't quite know how to say it or it made you feel uncomfortable. Now think one ring out. Think about the community in which you live. This would include your neighborhood school, the local government. In that circle, Are there issues that need to be addressed? Are there conversations that need to take place? And then there's this outermost circle. That's the country and the world in which you live. How about that space? Ask yourself this question. Where do I need to demonstrate greater candor with other people? Again, it's not being bombastic. It's it's speaking the truth in love. Sometimes it's saying a hard thing, but sometimes it's saying the most important thing that isn't being said. Where are you called to speak out for justice and equity for others that arises out of your belief in Jesus and the way he called us to live and be? Your ability to speak with candor that's rooted in love and a desire for God's will to be done is a measure of the courage that you live. It's about the risk that you're willing to take because of your faith. 
So I wonder for you, what is a courageous conversation that you need to have? What's a conversation you need to have with some candor? Is there a person that you need to call and finally have a conversation with that you know you've needed to have for a long time to have the faith and to take a risk? And maybe it's one person or maybe it's several. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're walking through this morning. But what I do know is that this is a message that we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Because all of us are called to have these courageous conversations more often than we like to admit. I want to leave you with one example of what this looked like and a good example. It's a story about an older man named Jimmy. Jimmy. And one day, Jimmy walked out of his house and walked down to his mailbox, and it was crooked, and it was dented, and it obviously needed some pain. You know, one of the numbers had fallen off of it, and he opened the mailbox, and inside of it, he found an unsigned note. And the note said, please paint me, eyesore, your neighbors. Thanks. Well, after, his, after Jimmy showed the unsigned note to his wife, Marilyn, they were obviously pretty upset by that. They were not happy with it, and they told their daughter what had happened, and she posted the note on social media, and it became quite the story in their community. He later told reporters of how hurt he was, but also how frustrating it was, because the reality was the note didn't tell Jimmy and Marilyn anything they already didn't know. They were painfully aware that the house that they had lived in for over 50 years was in need of some improvements and some touch-ups and paint. And so what happened was, when that note, they were left with a sense of shame. They were left feeling less than important. Well, overnight, as these things sometimes happen, the Facebook post picked up a lot of traction and a lot of supportive people reached out to help Jimmy in Maryland. Uh, retailers and vendors started to offer their products or their services for free. The mayor of the town even stopped by and asked if she could lend a hand. Somebody who knew how to set up GoFundMes did one, and before you know it, within 48 hours, over $70,000 had been contributed to this older couple, most of whom had never met them. And it was only when the people began to ask questions, to have some courageous conversations with candor, that they found out that Jimmy had had a heart attack 15 years earlier. And it pretty much left it where he was unable to do all of those tasks around the house. He spent all of his days really caring for his wife, Marilyn, who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and was now bedridden and had been for many, many years. You see, to me, this is a great story of an example of how you or a community can reach out to others who are hurting and do so with candor. Really, the biggest part of candor is a willingness to go up to someone and to knock on their door and to begin a conversation, to begin a relationship. Instead of passing judgment or just deciding that I'm better than them and they need to figure it out, how can we be a part of a solution rather than just furthering the problem? And that feeling, that little bit of anxiety when the phone's ringing and you wonder if they're going to answer, when you're about to knock on that door and your stomach goes, you know what that's called? That's called courage. And it takes a lot of it to do these sorts of things. Friends, Jesus had courageous conversations all the time. When people went out on a limb, he met them there. And Jesus spoke the truth in love, and he spoke with candor. So again, I ask you, what are some of these conversations you need to begin having? Like Bishop Berlin said, with your neighbors, your coworkers, your family, your friends, that person that, you know, keeps forwarding you emails that you don't agree with. I don't know. But I know there has got to be one. And maybe you can begin praying and asking to God this week for help in having that conversation. Because you never know, you never know how it'll turn out. And that's where the faith comes in. Let's pray.